Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Landheis, and I am the director of the Stalking Prevention Awareness and Resource Center. I want to thank you all so much for joining us today in celebration of the 19th annual Stalking Awareness Month. I'd like to hand it over to Ginger from the Office on Violence Against Women to welcome you as well. Hi, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for taking the time to be here today to learn about important work related to investigating and prosecuting stalking and supporting survivors, as well as training a multitude of professionals on how to respond with competence and compassion to this to this crime and other forms of gender-based violence. My thanks to Jennifer and the Spark Center and Equitas and NCJ FCJ, and to the three organizations that will be sharing the innovative and groundbreaking work that they've been doing today. And this, this webinar is convened during National Stalking Awareness Month, and according survivors and addressing this crime is a priority at the Department of Justice. And so before we get started, I have some remarks to share from the Associate Attorney General, Vanita Gupta. So we'll get those queued up for you before we move into the rest of the programming. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm joining you today from the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Nacotchconk and Anacostan and Piscataway peoples in Washington, DC. I am honored to join you today in recognizing January as National Stalking Awareness Month. The Justice Department is committed to using all its tools to address stalking. Stalking is a pattern of behavior intended to provoke fear and erode a victim's sense of safety. Perpetrators intrude on multiple aspects of victims' lives in their homes, workplaces, and digital worlds. They violate victims' privacy and threaten their ability to go about their lives as normal, often causing physical, psychological, and social harm. Studies have shown that survivors of stalking report higher than average rates of depression, anxiety, and insomnia, and they may take time off work to protect themselves. And studies show that for many, this terror lasts for years. Stalking is also a significant risk factor for intimate partner homicide. Alarmingly, nearly one in three women and one in six men have reported being stalked at some point in their lifetime. Yet because of the insidious nature of this crime, it can be challenging for victims to identify what they are experiencing as stalking and to know where to go for help. In 2019, only about 32% of stalking victims reported the incidents to the police. Those who do file reports may face additional barriers to justice and healing, as stalking can be difficult to investigate and prosecute. People who are suffering stalking and the justice and victim services professionals who work on their behalf need tools and resources to navigate stalking situations and ensure perpetrators are held accountable. I am grateful to our Office on Violence Against Women and the Stalking Prevention Awareness and Resource Center for providing exactly those resources and for holding the strategy showcase today. I also want to express my gratitude to OVW's grantees who provide essential services and justice solutions in their communities and who today will offer us a glimpse into the approaches they have crafted to stop stalking before it escalates and to help survivors restore their sense of safety. Thank you. Thank you again to OVW, Spark, the Pitt County Sheriff's Office, the West Virginia Foundation for Rape Information Services, and the Prosecuting Attorneys Council of Georgia for your dedication to ending all forms of gender-based violence, including stalking. And thank you to all our attendees for joining us here to learn more and for furthering our shared commitment to making communities safer. So as you may have guessed, SPARK is funded by the Office on Violence Against Women. And I want to highlight a few things as we start today, but I'm going to make my remarks very brief so that we can spend a lot of time highlighting the amazing work that the three folks who are on here are doing in their communities. So just as a reminder, if you're not familiar with SPARK, hopefully all of you are, we provide in-person and virtual trainings, resource materials, technical assistance, which is the fancy way of saying if you are working on a case or you need assistance in developing policies, protocols, et cetera, please reach out to us. And then of course, we're gonna be highlighting some of the pu public awareness resources and efforts that are going on across the country. 
as some of you may know, Spark is in charge of National Stocking Awareness Month, and I'll give you a little bit of history about how that came about. But we also offer subject matter expertise, and you're going to be hearing from three amazing individuals who are working on this issue on the ground who can give you a peek into what it's like to develop that particular expertise. You can check out all of this information that we're going to highlight today on Spark's website, stockingawareness.org. And you can also find a recording of this particular webinar. I saw some, some of you asking in the chat. So in about 10 days or so, you can check out our website. Emma linked it for you in the chat and you can see a recording of this particular presentation. Stocking Awareness Month came about for the first time in 2004 because of the efforts of numerous individuals, including activist Debbie Riddle, who petitioned Congress after her sister was brutally murdered by her stalker. And so that particular case happened in 2003 and in 2004, thanks to Debbie's efforts and those of numerous individuals across the country, Stalking Awareness Month began. And Spark has been leading that effort since we were founded in 2018. In addition to some of the efforts that these grantees are going to highlight for you, I also wanna call attention to some of the resources that are available on Spark's website for Stalking Awareness Month including some action guides available in English and in Spanish. Many of you, I hope, are sharing our daily social media posts on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook. There's posts that are designed for each day of this month. We hope that you are continuing to create awareness beyond just the month of January, and you can feel free to share those posts throughout the year. We hope that you do so. We also have available on our website, public resource, public awareness resources. So if you are energized by the work that's going on across the country after these individuals talk to you today, you can also download training materials to be able to do your own work in your own community in creating awareness to stalking, as well as share some of the resources, like fact sheets and infographics, as well as disciplinary specific resources. So on our website, we have resources for prosecutors. You're gonna be hearing from Charlotte Jackson from the prosecuting, the prosecuting Attorneys Council in Georgia. We have information for law enforcement. You're gonna be hearing from John Gard from the Pitt County Sheriff's Office, as well as those awareness materials that Sarah is going to be highlighting their work at the West Virginia Foundation for Rape and Prevention Services. So please check out all the, that information on our website, including some response checklists, et cetera. But now I really want to turn it over to the folks who are gonna highlight the efforts that they are working on across the country. So our first presenter today is Sarah from the West Virginia Foundation for Rape Intervention Services. And Sarah and I have been working together for numerous years since we started Spark. And Sarah and the West Virginia Foundation are doing some amazing work when it comes to stalking. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah to highlight those endeavors. Thank you so much, Jennifer. It is such an honor to be here today. As Jennifer said, my name is Sarah and I am the Prevention and Stalking Program Coordinator for the West Virginia Foundation for Rape Information and Services, which is a lot to say, otherwise known as West Virginia Frizz. And so what West Virginia Frizz is, is we are the State Sexual Assault Coalition of West Virginia. And we were established in 1982. We are comprised of our state's rape crisis centers. And we provide trainings, technical assistance, and resources to folks across our state. Our focus areas at West Virginia Frizz are sexual violence, dating violence, human trafficking, and stalking. And so I personally wear two hats for West Virginia Frizz. And so on one side of things, I am part of our prevention team. And then on the other side of things, I am also the stalking programming coordinator for our entire state, which is what I'm so proud to talk to you about today. As part of my role, I participate on national work groups like Sparks Community of Practice, and I also participate on statewide work groups that address the intersections of oppression and violence, such as our LGBTQ plus work group and our disabilities work group. I'm so grateful to be here today to share what we do related to stalking at a state coalition level, and also to share the great work related to stalking 
that our allied partners, such as our campuses and crisis centers are doing, some of which I, I saw in the chat here supporting me today. Thank you so much. I think um, it is, it's my honor really to bring, to talk about the work we do at the coalition level and to bring their work to a broader audience. And so when thinking about our stocking programs, I get to look at it from several different angles that really help me have a comprehensive approach to our trainings, to the resources that, that we provide, and to the technical assistance that we provide. And so that includes things like addressing stocking on our campuses and in our communities. It includes thinking about the judicial system response to stocking. It includes thinking about making sure that our rape crisis center advocates are trained and have appropriate services, and it includes being survivor-centered. And so, so when I talk about that more specifically, what I mean is, and I think my slides are advancing a, a little too much for me to keep up with here, so I'm going to go back just a few here. And so what I mean by that more specifically is I get to look at through my position, which was created not only to address gaps, but to be an actual program where folks in our state can get and receive information, training, and technical assistance. And it's a position of continual learning for me. And so I get to spend my time learning about our state and how to help folks. I get to learn about the needs of our state and help address those gaps and try to provide solutions. And so specifically what that looks like for us at a coalition level is I get to dig deep into issues like what kind of experiences stalking victims have when they engage with the civil and criminal justice system and how we can help folks who work in those positions from front desk staff to law enforcement officers, to prosecutors, to magistrates, to judges, how we can help them understand stalking more and be part of the solution to keep victims safe and hold offenders accountable. I get to think through things like, what does stalking look like on our campuses? And how can we help our campus staff better identify, respond to, and prevent stalking? I get to think about how we can help students on our campuses better identify when they are being stalked and how to get help. I get to think about how we can make sure our rape crisis center staff understand stalking, that they understand how to screen for stalking behaviors, that they understand how to safety plan around stalking, even if they're working with somebody who discloses sexual or domestic violence to begin with. So help them understand all those other crimes that stalking intersects with. I get to work on how we can center and lift up survivor voices and how I can work together with all of those folks I just mentioned plus national organizations like SPARC to saturate our state with stalking information, education, response, and prevention efforts. And so how do we do that? What are some things that we do to accomplish those goals? Well, our first thing that we provide to our state is training and resources. So for example, every year we have an annual sexual assault and stalking symposium, which draws a multidisciplinary crowd. And this year, our symposium is in, on its 23rd year. So just as an example, in 2022, at our sexual assault and stalking symposium, we featured a keynote from a stalking survivor, Anna Nassit, entitled The Role of Community in Supporting Survivors. And then we followed that by a presentation from Spark about building capacity and community relationships beyond the SART to meet survivor needs. So beyond those sexual assault response teams or other multidisciplinary moving into community. And this year, our symposium will be no different. It will feature presentations regarding image exploitation and tech facilitated stalking. So that's one way that we help to meet needs. We also bring in national organizations like Spark. We've had them for several trainings, we brought them in for their training, buying and responding to stalking. We brought them in for our campus folks to provide a presentation about stalking on campus. We have one of our campuses bringing them in later this month for National Stalking Awareness Month to provide a presentation to their students. And then we also create our own resources. So in addition to all the great resources that Jennifer mentioned that Spark provides, we use all of their resources, all of those fact sheets, all of those infographics, all of their guides for multidisciplinary folks to create specific West Virginia resources for our folks. And so one of those resources that is that we created our very own training of the trainer curriculum. And so our TOT, 
is a three hour curriculum for folks that we put together and it includes information about the specific stalking laws we have in West Virginia, the frequency of stalking, including statistics and dynamics. It includes information about intersectionality with technology and other crimes. It includes case scenarios that those folks who work on those multidisciplinary teams can review to help them address, address gaps and provide better services. It includes information about the dangerousness and lethality of stalking and risk factors and the impact that it has, and it includes information about safety planning. So we provide that training of trainers to folks. We give them the three-hour curriculum along with the facilitator guide and a PowerPoint for the folks who, who come to our training, and we will continue to have that TOT as needed uh, in our state. We also have certain listservs that we use to disseminate information. So for example, we have a listserv of all the Rape Crisis Center advocates across West Virginia, our sexual assault victim and advocate listserv. And so we use that listserv to disseminate information about stalking. And we also have a listserv specific to our campuses called the Intercollegiate Council Against Sexual Violence, or we refer to it as the ICC for our campus folks. And so we use that listserv to disseminate information as well. And then every year we also create our own National Stalking Awareness Month toolkit. And so just as an example, our 2022 toolkit that we create, and we create it for multidisciplinary folks, was called the ABCs to Addressing Stalking, awareness, behavior identification, and coordinated community response. And that toolkit had an overview about stalking, including screening questions. We also put together, like Jennifer said, Spark makes a social media guide and has social media posts for every day of January. We create a social media guide as part of our NSAM toolkits as well for our folks that includes a graphic for every day in January, accompanying post language that they can use to post with that graphic. And we also created three whole presentations that included PowerPoints and facilitation guides for sexual assault response teams. So for folks who are part of those multidisciplinary teams, we put together three agendas, three presentations for those teams to go over. And then this year, our NSAM toolkit was entitled Stalking Overview and Tips. And tips stood for tech facilitated stalking, improving response, prevention strategies, and again, our social media guide. And then I just wanted to provide you with a snapshot. We recently just had an ICC meeting this week where our rape crisis centers and our campus folks came together and they told us about all the things that they've been doing for National Stalking Awareness Month. And I wanted to share some of that with you guys. So some of our folks have hosted screenings with facilitated discussions. So such as using Spark's You Discussion Guide to hold an event for students to discuss the stalking behaviors in that particular show. Some folks have reviewed stalking case scenarios at their multidisciplinary team meetings to help identify gaps and improve coordinated community response. Some folks have created stalking specific podcasts and social media campaigns. Some folks have hosted countywide proclamations for National Stalking Awareness Month. And some folks have hosted guest speakers such as Debbie Riddle, as Jennifer mentioned, which is sort of the spark that led to National Stalking Awareness Month, as well as Anna Nasset, like I, like I mentioned earlier, and bringing in Spark. As I said, one of our campuses is going to do a little later this month. And so when we talk about all the things that we get to do with our stalking program in West Virginia, how do we help meet those needs? So sort of to bring it back to the beginning, what does stalking look like on our campuses and how can we help our campus staff better identify, respond to, and prevent stalking? And so we brought Stalk Spark in to provide a training for our campus folks and we continue to bring Spark in to do trainings. We dedicated a section of our 2022 NSAM toolkit and a section of our three-hour stalking training of the trainer specifically to provide information and resources on this particular topic, how to better identify, respond to, and prevent stalking on campus. But we, then we don't just tuck those things away into other um, trainings. And so when we talk about 
How can we help the students on our campuses better identify when they are being stalked? Well, we'll use any opportunity we can. And so we make sure that we provide stalking information within those mandatory trainings that our students are supposed to receive as incoming students to our campuses. You know, the Title IX trainings, the bystander intervention trainings. We make sure that we include stalking information in those trainings with the understanding that stalking is a pattern of behavior. And so we make sure that our bystander intervention trainings address that 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 somebody might have intervened in a particular behavior and stopped that particular behavior, but that stalking is a course of conduct. And so we do have a caveat when it comes to our bystander intervention trainings. Um, and then we also just provide stalking specific trainings to students. Our campuses will bring us in to talk to their resident assistants or maybe to talk to a particular Greek organization or athletic team about stalking specific trainings to specific student populations. And so we tuck it in where we can. We take the opportunity where we can to talk about stalking. And then we also take the opportunity to do stalking specific trainings with our campuses and with our students as well. And then we get to think through how do we help folks who work in the civil or cr criminal justice system understand stalking more and be part of the solution. And so some of the ways we've addressed that is that we provided a training to all of the magistrate assistants in our states. And so you know, those are the, the folks that um, might be the first person that a victim interacts with within the criminal justice system. The folks who work the desk when you walk in or answer the phone, the folks who help assist with personal safety orders. And so we provided a training to them. We also have other upcoming trainings with other criminal justice system folks like our judges. We offer training and resources for our law enforcement staff. And all those folks also come to our sexual assault and stalking symposium as well. And then in the past four years, we have also distributed 4,000 stalking resource kits to our allied partners that include things like stalking documentation logs and also tools, safety tools like personal alarms. And then as far as our advocates in our rape crisis centers, making sure that they understand this crime and that they are equipped to respond to this crime. So aside from the, the training of the trainer that we did, that a lot of our advocates attended, we also have a certification process for our advocates called the Core Advocate Training or the CAT. And as part of the CAT, our advocates do receive stalking specific training as well as safety planning specific training. We also present on stalking at the Statewide Victims Assistance Academy, which is a multidisciplinary training for our domestic violence advocates, folks who work in our child advocacy centers, folks who work in our probation and parole offices, et cetera. And so we also make sure that we lift up survivor voices and that we create space for them at our trainings, like our sexual assault and stalking symposium, and that we collaborate with them to help us provide better outreach and to inform our resource creation. And then how can we work with all of those folks in our state plus national organizations like SPARC to saturate our state with stalking information education to help improve response and prevention? And for us at, at a coalition level, that just means continuing to connect the dots for folks about how stalking intersects with so many things, with the work that so many people are doing across our state and being intentional about providing stalking training and information year round, and not just during National Stalking Awareness Month, and highlighting and utilizing the work of our TA providers like Spark to help us do that. And so the positive impact of all of that is that we have a stalking program right here in our state in West Virginia that exists for folks to utilize that provides technical assistance, training, and resources. We recently updated our stalking law to be more comprehensive. And because of all the work that we're doing, all the multidisciplinary work that we're doing, we have folks in the field who have a better understanding of stalking and who are better prepared to respond to it. And that can lead to many, many other things. And so what we hope it's doing is that it's changing the response, that it's given folks a bigger picture and therefore understanding of stalking, that it's not just physically following someone. And that has such far-reaching potential, the potential to directly affect numerous things like 
the number of personal safety orders that get granted, or the number of Title IX investigations that result in sanctions or improved response and support, or an improvement in services at our crisis centers, or safety planning that saves someone's life, that it results in active, educated bystanders. And so we are doing all of this work around stalking and we are seeing the impact that it has. But of course, we can always do more. And we also need to do more, particularly with our underserved populations. And so there's still such a need for more information, like what stalking looks like in the LGBTQ plus community or for older adults or for adolescents or for folks with disabilities, for example. And I know Spark is working on that. I know they just put out new resources related to all of those things. And so we're so excited at West Virginia to get those and disseminate those across our state. And so we reach a lot of people, but there are still a lot of folks who have little or no education about stalking. So we've come a long way here in West Virginia. We're excited to share with you what we've done, but we do recognize that we still have a long way to go. And with the help of our campuses and crisis centers and, and everybody working together in our state, I think we'll get there. Thank you so much for letting me talk to you today about what we're doing. Thank you so much to the West Virginia folks that showed up to the webinar today to support me. Thank you so much, Sarah. Every time I hear you talk about the amazing work that you're doing in West Virginia, I get so excited and so hopeful that we're seeing this change across the country in the response to by and respond to stalking. So thank you so much for highlighting the work that you're doing. If you have questions for Sarah, please feel free to put them in the chat. We're hoping that at the end of the presentation today, after we hear from our next two presenters, that we can open it up to have some question and answer time. But I also want to make sure that we're giving both John and Charlotte a chance to talk as well. So. You can go ahead and put those questions in the chat. And I would like to introduce John Gard from the Pitt County Sheriff's Office. So John is the Chief Deputy at Pitt County and has been working on the issue of violence against women for lots and lots of years. And I'll let him introduce himself a little bit more. But huge thank you to John. And John's going to highlight some of the work that's being done on the ground within law enforcement agencies. One of the goals when Stalking Awareness Month was started was to improve the response by law enforcement in particular to this particular issue. And so I think John is, and their department is doing a fantastic job of identifying and responding to stalking. And John's going to give us a little glimpse into what that looks like. So John, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Welcome everyone. It's, it's great to share some time with you all today. And I'm going to talk about, you know, what we're, what we're talking about today, stalking, but I'm going to kind of look at the benefits of training to the criminal justice system. A lot of it surrounding law enforcement, obviously, but as everybody knows, there's other tentacles within the criminal justice system. And we'll, we'll talk about that. I do want to give you a little bit of background and information about our community, as well as the sheriff's office as well. And let's see. So Pitt County, just a little bit about us. We're about 656 square miles. North Carolina has 100 counties. So we're one of those 100, we're like the 10th most populous. Wouldn't say we're urban, but I wouldn't say we're rural. When I moved up here in the late eighties to go to school, you know, I, I would say we were a rural community then, but things change, we grow, and we certainly have. Our population is somewhere around 200,000 right now. Our staffing, and I'll give you a little breakdown about this, and you'll see how this is important as we, we go on today. But if you look at our staffing specifically, our breakdown officer to citizen ratio is about 0.7 officers per, per thousand for service population. What does that mean to anybody? Probably not a whole lot, but when you look nationally, folks, uh, sort of lean towards a staffing of 2.2 to 2.4 officers per thousand. Our ratio at 0.7, that's if we're fully staffed, we're running a little short, like a lot of law enforcement agencies across the country right now. So bottom line is, you know, we've got to do more with less and we've got to be efficient in our duties. So that's really where where this presentation is going to come into play. And, and while we're so interested in receiving more information about stalking. Background about myself, I'm in my 31st year in law enforcement now, but going way, way, way back to 1996, we had a number of domestic violence homicides in our community, which propelled us to seek funding to set up a specialized 
unit to address domestic violence. And we did. We formed our domestic violence prevention unit back January 1st, 1997. We did this again to address domestic violence specifically. And those of you that are at, towards the end of your career, I guess, or like like me, you know, there's been an evolution over the years when we talk about domestic violence specifically. You know, when I started and went through the academy, a couple of things that rang true is there was no specific training to domestic violence. And when you, you break that down and think about it for a second, you're talking the second most committed crime, second only to theft, and we had no training specific to domestic violence. And what little bit we may have had being just peer-to-peer -peer training, watching older officers respond to these type cases was, if I can be honest, just horrible. Not saying we cause a lot of the downfall or why we got it there. Obviously, the offenders have to be held accountable for their actions, but we as a criminal justice system, we need to have the training to how to address it in the right way. So the majority of our homicides back then, over 50% of all the homicides were attributed to domestic violence, hence why we started our unit. You know, with the ultimate goal to improve our response to these type of cases, but it went bigger than just a response or a follow-up or serving a criminal or civil process. It was really to look specifically in addition to those, but to look at policy and procedure, bringing that up. And we did, we've evolved, we've become, we looked at our policy, tweak that in a way where it was arrest being the preferred response. We did training specifically on identifying predominant aggressor and really tried to tune in on increasing victim safety as well as offender accountability. And all that really came to training, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today specific to stalking. And to really conduct annual assessments is what we're doing working. You know, a lot of times when I do presentations, around to the criminal justice system or members of the criminal justice system. You know, for so many years, we kind of get in that rut where we always do what we've always done. But the second part of that statement is, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always gotten. So kind of the definition of what insanity is. So in, in Pitt County, we talk about domestic violence, our homicide data, we have looked at every homicide we've had since the early 90s to date and did kind of a, a lethality review on those, looked to see what were the common trends like many communities around the country and could what we identified, could we address it as the criminal justice system and negate some of those weaknesses? And this is what we found in all our homicides. In every one of them, 100%, the victim, who was later murdered, had either left the relationship or was planning to leave the relationship. Depending on what research you look at, you're going to see in the upper 80 percentile that that's happened. So that's not unique to Pitt County. That's across our country. But also, when we look at those, stalking was identified post-homicide in 100% of those cases. So We've seen this repeatedly over and over and over again over the years. And our goal, our mission was to address that. Now, we do a lot of things related to domestic violence as far as different ways to respond, our investigative techniques, our follow-ups, a little different than what may be considered traditional, if you will. But we, were, we knew we were lacking on our stalking. Not so much the unit members, but the, the folks that are assigned to the domestic violence unit were, or as of today, are a follow-up unit. So they're not getting it on the front end. So it's really come down to identifying what stalking was. Kind of live by this, and I think so does the criminal justice system, the allied professionals within it. Almost every failure within the criminal justice system, I believe, can be linked to one of two things, either a lack of training or a lack of communication or a combination of both. And again, that's why we're we're here today and that's what I'm gonna talk about. So specific to our law enforcement training, we know it's critical internally. It's gotta be ongoing. You can't do a one and done just because of turnover, whether it's through folks leaving this office, going to another agency or retirement, you always got new staff coming in. So our training needs to be ongoing. But the reality is we're limited by the resources that are approved in our annual budget. And I did a breakdown as I was putting together these slides for, for Jennifer last week. I took our budget 
<clears throat> from 2019. And what we have allotted, and we're probably no different than most law enforcement agencies around, is about $300 per employee. And you go, well, John, that's not a, a bad amount of money. But if you take, say, two people from your crime scene investigative unit and send them out of state for a specialized training that's going to run, you know, 4,000 a person, that drops that 300 per employee significantly. So, so many times we were left with whatever training was offered at the local community college, not that it's bad, but sometimes it, it can be a canned presentation, if you will. And it's not the most forward thinking in the delivery, which is what we want our employees, our staff to receive the best of the best that's out here. And that, by the way, is how I come to know about Spark and, and Jennifer. And Jennifer and I go back a, a number of years. So when we were looking at doing this training. We knew this was identified. We, the unit members had seen Jennifer before. They deployed a lot of what they've learned, but we really wanted to target our line officers and not just within our agency or our community, but across the, the state. And that's where Jennifer and Spark came in. So when we had early discussions and I'd reached out to Jennifer and asked if she would be available through Spark to come to Pitt County. And we come up with a date and we said, look, we want this to be in person. And I know just like a number of you that are on today, have a background in training. You've either trained inter interagency within your community state and some probably even nationally, but you want to make sure the folks you bring in obviously have been vetted and we, we knew, I know personally Jennifer and Spark and what they've done over the years. So we knew we wanted her and we wanted this to be in person. And the reality is in the business of law enforcement, specifically first responders, we typically work rotating 12 hour shifts. So to get the biggest bang for our buck, we wanted to try to offer training over two days, same information each day to accommodate for the swing shifts kind of the split. And that's kind of not unique as it's done a lot of times within the law enforcement community. So Jennifer said she could do that for us. And as I mentioned, we had already vetted her, you know, I've been in this business for a long time now. And we, we always like, I just can't stress the importance of vetting who you bring in. You want to know what they're being, what they're delivering. And it had to be affordable. And here's what's great. And I'm going to give a shout out to our OVW folks that are here. The reality is most community across the country could not get this level of training. They could not afford it without the financial support of the Office of Violence Against Women and then people like Jennifer at Spark to deliver these. You're just not going to get it on the, the community college level, unfortunately. So the affordable, we're able to to check that block and every other block you see on the screen on the slide to have that. So our training, we delivered this on November 1st and 2nd of this past year, 2022, here in Greenville. It was at uh, it was delivered on the campus of our community college. They've been great partners. They allowed us at no cost to come in and have space with ample parking and, and just were really great to work with. We opened this training up, not just to the law enforcement officers, but to prosecutors, advocates, and any, any first responder around. Again, the training was done, same information each day to accommodate for those swing shifts. And it was opened up to agencies from all over the state. And we had folks come from the Western part of the state, as you saw in the early slides, we're kind of in the Eastern portion of North Carolina. So folks actually made the, the drive down to Greenville. And again, it's, it's all because of this training and stuff. They're not going to get access to at their local community college. We had over a hundred attendees attend the training, which was really, we thought really good. We had the capacity to run a little more than that, but this is one of the first trainings we've hosted post code. Everything prior to that, as, as most of you all are aware, was online. And for me as a trainer personally, I think sometimes it's difficult to get the training to the level. I just don't know if you can do it online versus in person. I know when I deliver information, I like to read 
folks can Essex, especially when it's the law enforcement community, because they sometimes don't like to ask questions, but just kind of read their body language and, and you can address certain things that folks may not be getting or having trouble with. So benefits, first things first, and I'm talking about post training and, and when Jennifer came down to Greenville is this, the greatest benefit we have seen was our first responders identifying stalking as stalking. You know, we know it's a pattern of behavior, but you have to have reports. You got to be able to show the pattern and you got to ask the questions and not have the expectation that the person you're working with, the victim or the survivor is going to think like the investigating officer. So you've got to be able to, as a responding officer, first responder, be able to ask questions that draw out detail specific to stalking and the elements within your statute of your, your state. Now, <clears throat> our increase, and again, this isn't a scientific thing. This is just John doing some basic math. November 1st through, I guess it was uh, January 13th, 2021 to 2022, 2022 to 2023. We just looked at a couple of months, about almost two and a half months. And just in that short amount of time, comparing the same timeline last year to this year, we saw a 350% increase in the number of stalking incident reports. A lot of other benefits, I'm going to talk about a few of them, but just think about that. That shows you how many cases potentially are getting misdiagnosed on the initial response. And you're only going to pick up so much, and I'm referring to the, the detectives within the domestic violence unit, looking at the case post-report or post-call, you know, based on what is written in the report that's submitted. So 350% uh, increase. Again, it's not that we had more stalking, it's just we were better at identifying. And there are certain things that go back to what I, I spoke about earlier about the two common themes we've had with homicide. We've always identified stalking post-murder. You know, we, we do the, the fatality review. So that's critical for us. And I couldn't be more proud of our staff. They were really engaged during those, those two days and they learned a lot. So Jennifer came in, shared a number of tools that were really beneficial to us and you know, this presentation is meant to look at increased awareness of stalking, give you some ideas for your own communities, not going to do a training on the risk profile, but that is one thing. And this is an assessment that can be done. And our agency and office is very familiar, our community with leveraging assessments. We have deployed the lethality assessment instrument in Pitt County a number of years ago. So they're accustomed to doing that. Same thing with stalking. You have a, a stalking assessment that's online that can be done. And Jennifer and Spark shared that information here like she does all over the country. And what really stuck out to me is one of the attendees that, that attended the training, on his next shift, he come across a case that was stalking and actually used the online assessment, attached it to his case file. And I couldn't have been more proud because this individual, great officer, great law enforcement officer, but has no desire to be a member of the domestic violence unit. He wants to, to stay within the patrol division, kind of be the jack of all trades, but it just showed that it clicked with our staff. So again, I couldn't have been more proud and the information that is received or given back once your data from the initial call is placed into this online assessment is phenomenal. Not only that, a side benefit is when that information is pulled out of the assessment and transferred to the investigative report, the incident report, it is stellar. I mean, it is top notch and makes a huge difference in, in what you're getting. Again, use the first day after the training. And then another thing is Trap Call, which is a, a program that assists victims of stalking with unmasking blocked phone calls. We talked about that at great length. We actually had one of our domestic violence unit members share the stage with Jennifer and walk through a case he had done. And again, now they're accustomed the members of the unit because they do get the specialized training and it's ongoing with them. And they, we do have access or have had access to funds through OVW that allow these staff members to get trained by the best of the best across the country. 
but our initial responders hadn't. But uh, it was really nice to to see that detective sharing the stage with Jennifer and walking through cases that we had already addressed and showing different techniques. It built a lot of credibility, even more credibility with the staff that's assigned to the domestic violence unit. And you could just see a buy-in across the board and not just the law enforcement officers that attended, but the prosecutors and advocates as well. I, Jennifer mentioned our questions will be placed in the chat and we'll kind of address it a little bit later in the presentation. I appreciate the time and opportunity to Spark and OVW, thank you for everything you do. I really, really appreciate your commitment, dedication to assist not only survivors, but us allied professionals in the field that could, there's no way we could do it without y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate it. The work that Pitt County is doing is amazing. And John just gave you a very brief glimpse into the way that they were implementing the training and resources that they receive as a result of Spark funding from OBW, but as larger resources as well. So we've had a chance to kind of lay the groundwork of what it looks like with a, a response and prevention efforts on a coalition level. John delved into what it's like to take those resources and implement them in an individual organization. And now we're going to move on to talking about how do we build this on the larger level? As most of us know, when you are working on an issue, it is so important that we are working with other disciplines and really doing a coordinated effort to address that particular issue, including staff. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Charlotte Jackson from the Prosecuting Attorneys Council of Georgia, who's going to highlight some of the work that Georgia is doing in regards to a stalking work group that Sharla and her office had started. So I'm going to turn it over to Sharla now. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you to Spark. Thank you to OVW. And what a great way to observe Stalking Awareness Month by talking about our initiative. We initially started out, I worked with the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Northern District of Georgia on a previous domestic violence initiative around DV and guns, and we were just kind of kicking around, thinking about what we wanted to do for Stalking Awareness Month, and I thought about it. I didn't want to just do something for a month. I wanted to do something that would make truly make an impact. So we started about, talked about putting together this Georgia anti-stalking work group. And Georgia's a big state. We have urban, we have rural, we have suburban areas, we have fun with lots of different concerns. But one of the great things we do have in Georgia is we have relationships and we collaborate. And so by us collaborating on this anti-stalking work group, we were able to get out of our silos and to share information and knowledge and so far, we are making a difference in our, our stalking prosecutions and hopefully helping victims. And there. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my agency, the Prosecuting Attorneys Council of Georgia. We are a state agency. Essentially, what we do is training, technical assistance, and support for prosecutors throughout the state. We provide 170 webinars, things, conferences per year. So we have a very strong training department. That training department allowed me coming up with this idea. Our training department was even able to provide us the technical and administrative support that we needed to be able to execute this project at a very high level. So I have been at PAC for nine years. I'm the domestic violence and sexual assault resource prosecutor. I provide training, technical assistance, and legislative support throughout Georgia. I also do national training for other prosecutors' offices. I'm active with In Violence Against Women International and working in this field is truly my passion. The first uh, really big case that I tried was a stalking case. And uh, being able to see the impact of stalking on this victim, not just on her, the, the, the way that the batterer made her world so small, but taking her away from her family, from her coworkers, and even from her children and affecting their ability to grow really showed me the impact of stalking on society. And so I do what I do because I love the people and this initiative has really given us a great opportunity to follow through with that. So 
our members. First thing we did actually thinking about the work group was reach out to Jennifer at Spark. We wanted to kind of talk about how to structure this particular initiative, areas to observe. She really made great suggestions about who we should include on this work group. And so here's our list of our members. We collaborated with the Northern and Southern District of Georgia U.S. Attorney's Offices. We have an outstanding state commission on domestic violence that played an important role in providing us necessary data. They do a fatality review and collect all the data on the impact of domestic violence in Georgia. We were able to use some of that data to inform our training decisions. Georgia Legal Services is another partner. We partner with them on other initiatives as well. They provided us with crucial information on protective orders and other resources for victims. Our elected attorneys and our other elected solicitors general, other prosecutors, so that we could identify what those training gaps were and what those needs were for prosecutors with boots on the ground handling these cases our law enforcement officers, Spark. We work a lot with our court-based advocates, of course, as prosecutors, but our community-based victim advocates. We got our collaboration allowed us to truly see the impact of stalking on victims and identify those needs. Particularly, we're thinking about those cases where perhaps our prosecutors or law enforcement we didn't have the knowledge to identify a case of stalking, and they're more likely to see a community-based advocate, of course, than someone in the court system. So they provided us great impact. And then we also worked with a criminologist who's able to give us great information on the data, the criminal trends, and the impact of stalking in our state. And so we had a four factors things that we wanted to accomplish. That was to identify, this is primarily a training initiative. And so we wanted to identify those immediate and long-term training needs. We wanted to establish a work group so that we could get together, evaluate what we were doing, and also use our collective expertise to provide this information. We identified existing resources and needs and doing all that, we wanted to ensure victim safety and offender accountability. So we'll talk a little bit about our outcomes. Essentially, our training initiative, we had started, we did all of our training last year and in 2021. 2021, of course, was a COVID year. We actually were able to use that as not necessarily a detriment, but as an opportunity to provide very high level, very specialized training via webinar, which made it very available for more people in the state. And so we really just, we had a, actually a bunch of Zoom calls we got together with our stalking work group and our, our, our experts in the field, and we identified a number of topics. We identified the gaps and then we identified a number of training topics that we thought we needed to raise, raise the bar, raise a level on our stalking prosecutions. And so we started off with Spark to providing training on identifying and responding to stalking. And the reason that we started there is because we wanted everyone to kind of identify the issue and we wanted everyone to be on the same page, on the same level, and kind of be prepared for the rest of the lessons that were to come. And we had one training, essentially one seminar, approximately one seminar every month. And so our audience came to expect some type of stalking information coming monthly. We started it in February and, and went throughout the rest of the year. And so understanding stalking in Georgia, that was the uh, presentation done by our criminologist and someone from the Georgia Commission on Family Violence talking about the laws around stalking and the impact of stalking on victims. We collaborated with our federal partners to talk about federal stalking charges. One of the issues that we identified was the fact that because stalking may often take place or cross state lines, sometimes we may feel that we may not be able to handle a state prosecution or have jurisdiction for a state prosecution. And 
understanding the way that the federal and state laws interplay with each other was a very valuable understanding and a very valuable tool for going forward with those cases. And we really appreciated our, our U.S. attorney partners for that one. Investigative techniques and stalking cases, we actually had a federal investigator to talk about some of that and talk about some of the electronic stalking and other issues related to that. We collaborated with Equitas and they did a great presentation for us on building a stalking case, which took our attendees step by step from investigation to prosecution through jury, how to put a stalking case together. And so we really tried to provide lots of nuts and bolts that Georgia Legal Services provided us on our protective order, TPOs and enforcement of TPOs. And that is, we usually, when we work in the criminal space, we don't always consider the civil part of it or the civil remedies that we can use to enhance our prosecutions and to provide that greater safety for our victims. And that was really, really valuable. And like many others, I also want to shout out our Anna Nassett, who presented for us on victim-centered prosecution of stalking, because when we can focus on the impact of the work that we do, I think allowing people to have that perspective helps us to better pursue our prosecutions, but prosecutors, we're, we're not just people who put people in jail, but we are to improve public safety and we're supposed to do justice. And I think doing justice requires understanding the impact of the work that we do and pushing forward, even when it's difficult and knowing that our victims are counting on us and that our victims are greatly impacted, particularly in cases of intimate partner violence. Our victims are greatly impacted by the work that we do. If we can stay focused on that, we can continue to provide high-level services to our community. And then finally, we wanted to provide more of the nuts and bolts and tools. We, in January of 2022, we were able to do regional training. And so we brought Jennifer and Spark in and we provided three days of training in North Georgia, Middle Georgia, and South Georgia. And that allowed more people to have that in-person training on stalking. And we trained 1,433 people on stalking, and that is on top of all the other training that our office does. So that was really, really a great number. And so we were excited to provide that information, but especially excited that so many people were able to participate and benefit from it. And so here's some of our outcomes. We looked at the our statistics. 2019, prior to the pandemic, so this is kind of like a normal prosecution year prior to the pandemic we are our, our our cases started out at a little bit the blue one the blue bar is a little bit above 2000 cases coming in and the yellow bar would be a little bit less than 2500 cases being opened we have our pandemic year which was a little odd so we don't we we can't really look to that as an example, but if you look at the 2021 and 2022 cases, you can see that we increased the number of stalking cases coming in closer to the 2,500 number, and those cases are open, which means people are actually working, accepting and working these cases. And then 2022, we can also see a high number of cases being brought in. And we see more cases opened, and we also see that more cases were closed. And so just this is just a snapshot, not all of the prosecutions in the state. This is a snapshot of our initial data. And so we can see that people are prosecuting more stalking cases, which is what we want to happen. But we also looked at, for every training that we do, we do a survey and we like to read the comments. And I just clipped a few comments from our, our surveys. And the idea on this first comment, we have a practitioner talk about right after the webinar, a victim contacted them about a stalking incident and they knew what to do and how to handle that case based on that information that we provided. So that is exactly what we want. And we also saw that our webinars were highly rated 9.55 out of 10. And so we are very 
very excited about that. And so what are our next steps? Um, we want to continue with our training and we're actually going to have bring we're going to bring spark back to do advocate specific training at our victim advocates conference we want spark to do more training for our prosecutor and investigative teams and we're looking forward to that we want to convene some regional dialogues in our state just to get an idea of where we are now that we've started this training, identify more of those training needs. One of the trainers that I work with has talked about how learning training is a conversation and having a dialogue with the attendees, with the recipients, with the end users of our training can really help us to greater, to better identify what those needs are. We're going to do more enhanced training because we want to do more of, of what's working. And we also, um, in the long term would like to examine our policy, our state policies and how we handle things to make sure that we are consistently using best practices. And if there's any gaps in our existing policies or laws, we'd like to examine those so that we would be in a better position to make recommendations. And so we are so excited to be able to present about our program today. Thank you to Spark and to OVW and congratulations to our other presenters and for all the great work that you're doing on behalf of victims. Thank you so much, Sharla. Wow, you all are doing amazing work. I knew when we were pu pulling this webinar together that you were, but it's so awesome to hear the amazing work that's going on in communities across the country. So now we would love to open it up to questions that you might have for our presenters about things that you know came up for you as you were listening to them highlight the work that they're doing in their communities, additional information that you might need. And the best way to facilitate answering those questions would be if you put them in the chat for us, and then we can ask them of our presenters so that they can answer about the work that they're doing, et cetera. So we'll give you all a few minutes to go ahead and start populating the chat with some questions. And the first one comes up for from Gretchen, and I think Sarah, this this will, you'll be the best person post to answer this question. Gretchen's asking, how can you explain how a bystander can help in this particular situation? Yeah, can you repeat that question one more time? I'm so sorry. Oh no worries. It's asking, how can you explain how a by, bystander can help in stalking situations? How are you defining that for them and thinking about that work? Yeah, Gretchen, thank you so much for that question. And so what we did is we provided a couple scenarios in our toolkits that showcased stalking behavior and maybe how somebody witnessing those particular behaviors could intervene in that situation. And again, then just provided the caveat that, of course, stalking is a course of conduct. And so intervening in one situation may not stop the stalking, but it stops that particular behavior. And so let me see if I can get an example for you here. And, and we also address this in our social media guide as well, bystander intervention with our social media graphic. So let me just pull up our toolkit. And while Sarah's doing that, I might throw another question back to Sharla and John while you're doing that. Sarah, is that all right? Sure, absolutely. Here's asking about thoughts about engaging law enforcement and prosecutors to acknowledge patients stalking healthcare providers in the healthcare setting. And that it, Carrie's saying that their local folks have been a little bit resistant to naming that behavior and protecting those healthcare employees. So, John, it might make sense most for you to start since it will start with you and then eventually end up in Charlotte's hands. So, answer yeah, that question. For me, it comes all down to communication and just having that conversation. Again, it's kind of like when we brought uh, Jennifer in to, to Pitt County, it was like they had the all home moment, the light bulb went off and people started picking up on that. I mean, we're, you know, I spoke more about domestic violence and stalking, but as you point out, stalking occurs across the gamut. So a lot of times it's just going to be a lack of understanding and just sitting down with those policymakers so they can understand it. You know, there's a line, a good friend of mine always uses, Mark Wendy said, the wag of the dog's tail begins at the head. And if you have those policymakers that have an understanding 
of what stalking is, you know, they can kind of draw that down. And again, it's going to, it's going to cross the gamut. You're going to have that, whether it's DV or stranger. And I can't overstate how dangerous this behavior is. And that's one of the things Spark has done in their delivery is talk about cases historically, both DV and non-DV that have ended in tragedy, but people don't know what they don't know. So gentle relentless pressure, you know, and once they understand, I think you'll, you'll see, you'll see that change, but it's, it's getting those key people to understand those policymakers. Yeah, Charlotte, do you want to add to that? I would agree with that. I would focus on the impact. And if you have any data showing the number of stalking incidents that you're able to tie it to increases in reported crimes, that can always be helpful. But data and showing the impact of this crime on these workers. If the stalking is keeping people from working in the healthcare industry, that's something that could get people's attention. And I will add one of the cases that was the impetus for change here in Pitt County, it was a DV case, but it happened at the hospital where he ended up stalking his former partner down and murder just outside the emergency room. You know, it was laying in wait. So again, things like that do occur. And if you would, I have my email information, I can send you information on that case specifically, if you'd like it obviously was lead at six and above the fold. So if that would help, I don't mind doing that for y'all. And we're, and Spark is also always available to provide technical assistance. If, if you're thinking about changes in your community that are needed, we do know a lot of the emerging data right now is pointing to the fact that victims are reporting to healthcare providers, but that healthcare providers themselves are being stalked. So not something, unfortunately, that we were surprised to hear you bring up, but something that we definitely need to be making sure we address. For those of you that are asking some of the questions about specific strategies that you can engage in as far as safety planning with situations, one of the things that we would encourage you to do is on Spark's website, there are safety planning guides for victims. Now, Spark doesn't work with victims directly. We would encourage you to please reach out to your local victim advocacy agencies, as well as law enforcement, et cetera. And if you would call our office, that's who we're going to refer you to. But working with those local folks to figure out those safety planning strategies is really important. So we have some links to some documentation logs and some safety planning documents on our website that are available in English and Spanish. And Emma has linked those for you. So please check those out and have some conversations with your local advocacy folks who can help you work on that individualized safety plan. Other questions that are coming in. Somebody asked about webinars on our website. So if you go to the archives on Sparks website, every national webinar that we do, which is about quarterly, is posted on our website. So you can check those out on that website for additional training, et cetera. Other questions that folks have. Someone also asked about the risks of confronting the stalker. Again, I would encourage you to have that individual conversation with an advocacy because depending on the relationship between the victim and the stalker and the specifics of that particular case, they may be able to lend more insight into those particular risks. That's where something like the SHARP assessment that John mentioned, which is the risk assessment, online risk assessment that can be done having that conversation with local law enforcement, et cetera, about some of the particular strategies and safety concerns can be really helpful as well. Other questions from folks have? So some folks are asking about proof of attendance. You can certainly reach out to us at Spark for that proof of attendance. Please don't reach out to the folks at TA to TA. They'll just refer you to us. But if you want to reach out to us at Spark, you can send an email to info and stockingawareness.org. And we can certainly look into providing that for you. We would ask you to just be patient with us. We've had lots of webinars this particular month. And so providing those certificates can be a little bit back longer at this particular moment in time. So other questions. Yeah, somebody's asking about a workplace violence policy. So we would encourage you to look at some of the resources on our website under information on for victim service providers or for victims themselves. We're currently collaborating with Futures Against Violence on workplace stalking, and we'll have some documents that will be coming out and posted on our website as well that you can check out those particular documents and reach out to us if, for instance, you're not able to access the information on the website. Other questions? Why well, you have all these brilliant folks on 
on with all of you. Jennifer, can I elaborate on the bystander intervention? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, so, so one reason that we use bystander intervention to help prevent stalking, and again, it's preventing behaviors, not so much the course of conduct, but it's because it's, it's an evidence-based approach that helps, number one, teach people skills. And so those skills that we hope to help people teach when we do our bystander intervention are recognizing those stalking behaviors. And so we know that st stalking is a course of conduct and it's just not following somebody around. So recognizing all the behaviors that could be part of that course of conduct. And so, for example, some stalkers may try to gather information from people who know their victim to try to figure out where they are or do something like that. And so recognizing that that could be a part of information gathering. And so being in those types of things. So for example, if somebody's constantly asking a group of people, you're in a group and somebody's asking everybody in a group where a particular person is, you can use the bystander intervention approach of being direct and just saying, you know, hey, stop asking where this person is. If they wanted to let you know, then they would have told you. And so it's really just helping folks build skills about being able to recognize all the behaviors that could be a part of a stalking course of conduct and then feel comfortable either addressing those behaviors directly or distracting somehow or delegating to somebody else who can help and create those social norms that protect against violence. Thanks so much, Sarah. Other questions? Give some folks just a couple of seconds to populate the chat because sometimes it can be a few seconds behind. But while that's happening, I just want to say that, you know, Sarah and John and Sharla aren't here just as talking heads. They are actually doing the hard work. They are doing amazing work in their communities and survivors are safer because of their work. And they're doing an amazing job holding those offenders accountable as well as spreading awareness. And we can't thank them enough for taking the tools and bills that were developed and really putting them into practice. We all know that sometimes that can be the hardest part of a response. And so I want to thank all of them for the amazing work that they're doing. And I appreciate that Sarah put her email in there and then Charla and John, if you wouldn't mind just putting your emails in there again quick, I know that that can be helpful to folks, but you can always reach out to us at Spark and we're happy to, to make you, put you in connection with folks. Any additional questions before I turn it back to Ginger at OBW to close us out? All right. Well, again, I want to thank all of you for the time that you spent today joining all of us. We know that you have lots of things on your plate. And so taking the time to hear about these efforts, but also a huge, huge thank you to John and Charla and Sarah for highlighting the amazing work that they're doing. And of course, to the Office on Violence Against Women who provides funding for Spark and whose brainstorm it was to pull this particular webinar together to highlight the amazing work that's going on across the country. So thank you to OBW and to John and Sharla and Sarah. And Ginger, is there anything that you would like to add to close things out? I'm just going to second and add to your thanks, Jennifer. Thanks to you. Thanks to Sarah and Sharla and John for the amazing work that you're doing in your communities. It's changing your communities and instructive to others who wish to, to follow the in your steps. And thanks to everybody who was here to learn today. I know everybody's schedules are busy, so taking this time out to absorb this new information and think about how you can use it, you know, thank you for doing that on behalf of OBW. And I also want to thank NCJ FCJ for making sure that this all went smoothly, as well as to our interpreter and captioners for ensuring that everybody could participate today. Thank you all, and thanks for the work that you do.